Well, hello and welcome to the next interview in our series of uh, discussions with inspiring green people from around the Asia Pacific region and around the world. Uh, it's my pleasure to have and introduce you to Dr. Maureen Faruqi today. Uh, Maureen grew up in Lahore in Pakistan, uh, moved to Australia and uh, became an engineer. Uh, worked in that field for quite some time uh, before uh, turning her mind and her passion to uh, the political realm. She became the first Muslim woman uh, to serve in any Australian parliament when uh, she entered the New South Wales Legislative Assembly in 2013, before moving to the Australian parliament in 2018, where she became Australia's first female Muslim senator. She is now an Australian Green Senator an inspiration to many in Australia and across the world, and also a recently published author with the book, Too Migrant, Too Muslim, Too Loud. Uh, Maureen, welcome to the interview. Hey, hello, Nick, and it is so, so lovely to be here with you. Quite an impressive resume. I don't know how to, how to follow this, but we'll start with the question that uh, we ask uh, all of the guests, which is, what does green politics mean to you? Well, I joined the Greens because of our party's propensity to speak on issues that no one else would. And I am ac acutely aware of and really also appreciate how we amplify conversations that are happening in the community, but that haven't yet made it into the political arena, mainly because politicians just want to ignore them. Um, these are conversations like marriage equality, decriminalizing abortion, First Nations justice, and welcoming refugees. So for me, Greens politics is about being bold and courageous and radical to push boundaries and to work with the community, not just to chase votes, but, but because it is genuinely the right thing to do. You know, the one thing that people often say to me is when they hear about, you know, my two decades long career in environmental engineering and sustainability is, oh, you know, now we understand, Marine, why you joined the Greens. Uh, and that's because our movement is quite synonymous with caring for the environment. But to me, that's only part of the story, Nick, uh, because it does frustrate me sometimes that we are seen as a single focus, when in fact, green politics is so much more environmental and social systems are quite inseparable. And, you know, and it is a recognition of this interconnection that I think will lead to environmental and social justice um, solutions um, on equality and climate crisis. And it is Green's politics, which is about the willingness to tackle the fundamental causes of inequality and the climate collapse that we face rather than just patching up the systems. And it's about imagining a society that isn't predicated on endless unsustainable planet killing economic growth, but it is about building a caring, just and decent life for everyone. You've mentioned there are a few of the uh, challenges that people face, not only in Australia, but around the world. What do you think are the main challenges confronting uh, parties, especially Greens, but also others across the Asia Pacific region at the moment? I think the broader challenges for anyone on this planet at the moment are pretty universal in some ways. And, you know, it is the challenges of COVID-19 and climate change. And both these particular crises have been highlighted and heightened um, sorry, both these crises have highlighted and heightened existing inequalities within the boundaries of nations, but also between the global south and global north. And I do think that with that has come more awareness amongst people about these challenges, about these inequalities. So for us, um, it has also opened up the door and an opportunity to actually seize this moment and try and convince more people that this is the moment to make different choices rather than continuing on the path of, you know, a rampant extractive and capitalist society that has brought us here. Hmm. There's a quote in your book, which I'll try to read correctly. Uh, 
I know that I'm not alone in my quest. Flames like mine flicker across the world. I hope one day all these flickering flames of hope will join together in a roaring blaze whose intensity will light up the world and make it a brighter place for all. It's a, it's a very strong vision. What role do you see organisations like the Asia Pacific Greens Federation and the Global Greens in connecting and intensifying those flames? I might start by saying that, you know, one of the roles that we play as Greens across the globe is trying to fight a system that is steeped in power, privilege and patriarchy. And sometimes that can feel like a lonely battle. It is those flames everywhere kind of flickering and not joined up yet, perhaps. Uh, but for me, when I feel alone, I do remind myself of the hundreds of people that you know, I've spoken with, rallied with on the streets, you know, camped out in the forests with, or you know, stood in um, you know, unbearable heat or torrential rain um, to campaign. And it is the solidarity of these people that keeps me going. Um, and I think for the Global Greens and Asia Pacific Greens Federation, we already have those structures in place that can connect like-minded and passionate people. So, you know, they, they already have the mechanisms to broaden and expand our movement. But I think we could be a bit more deliberate about venturing out of our comfort zones, because if we really want to dismantle those, um, you know, long held systems, then we will have to have conversations with people who may not necessarily agree with us, um, who we might not usually connect with. Um, so I think that is another one of our challenges, but I think the way we are and the way we are still connected across the world gives us an opportunity to be able to do that. And I think we might be surprised at how much in common we might have with some people that we think um, don't have the same passions as we do. That's interesting. Can you give an example from uh, your uh, political career? I, I hesitate to say career because uh, you are not a career politician. You had a, uh, uh, a long career in engineering before joining politics. Um, but are there examples of this uh, movement building, the solidarity that you could uh, give um, to highlight the point? Um, I can, absolutely. And you are right. I've never seen politics as a career. I think that's one of the problems we have in politics at the moment, like politics to me is really public service. Um, and, you know, when I give, uh, when I say that we need to connect with people who may not necessarily be part of our movement, I think that is something that I bring into politics in a way because I've had these 25 years of life outside the greens. And so my connections in engineering, in local government, in universities were people who, you know, I never put into a box as left or right, um, you know, or green or, you know, conservative or progressive. And we, you know, like generally when we live life, you know, we speak to our neighbors and we don't necessarily, um, you know, say, uh, put them in boxes. It's the same situation. But I, I do know that when I did join the Greens and people found out about it, um, I think their, their perception of why someone like me would join the Greens was a question mark for them because they do see sometimes the Greens movement as quite different to, um, to themselves. And I think those are the doors that we need to open. I do find that amongst us, we have a tendency to pretty quickly maybe disregard uh, people who may not believe most of what we believe in or we are passionate about. Um, and and it, those conversations are hard, Conversa having conversations with people who may not believe, let's say, in marriage equality or decriminalizing abortion uh, or may not agree with our stance on those issues are hard. And we think we might use our time um, to talk to people who actually agree with us to build the movement. But I do think that that has stopped us from expanding that particular movement. And when I speak about abortion decriminalization, this was a campaign that I ran when I was in New South Wales Parliament for about six years. And basically, the community 
whether they were Greens voters or Liberal voters or National voters or, you know, Labour voters, they came out in droves to support that campaign because we reached out and didn't care, um, you know, which party or which uh, kind of political colour people were from. It was at the end of the day, the goal to uh, decriminalise abortion in New South Wales that was important. And I think that's where an open mind and heart comes in to engage with people who are beyond um, your particular political affiliation. Your approach to building communities and building solidarity around issues, I think is something that comes through very strongly in your book. And it's something that the Global Greens and Asia Pacific Greens Federation want to strengthen within our parties and across the parties in our region. What do you think are some opportunities for uh, people, including from parties like the Australian Greens, to collaborate through APGF and these different international fora? In some ways, you know, Nick, the pandemic has removed that hesitancy some of us have had about connecting online, for instance. I mean, I know it's definitely changed my approach. And, you know, you, you just go ahead and meet, call people up now, now much more um, than you would do previous to the pandemic or, you know, Zoom meetings are becoming such a norm. Um, and uh, I think that has opened up access to more people and also access to more connections across the world. Um, and, and that helps um, with collaborating, uh, making collaboration easier. Um, but as I said in the, um, earlier, the challenges we face really are global. Um, they're not confined within arbitrary geographical boundaries of nations. Um, and they do stem from colonialism, from the global north, for instance, using a massive share of the Earth's resources, while the brunt of that is borne by those who were least responsible for it. And so the Asia Pacific Greens, we have a mix of those that have been the major cause of the problems and those that bear the brunt uh, for it. So I think that collaboration really has to be a two-way collaboration. Um, having grown up in um, you know, a, a country which was once colonized, I kind of grew up with an idea in Lahore that um, developed nations you know, were always better than us and always had um, you know, and, uh, better solutions uh, and could make us better. And I think that mentality still exists. So I think for us as Australian Greens, it is crucial to recognize um, that you know, these disparities and, and to work with representatives across um, you know, the Asia Pacific on, on their terms. Um, to learn more about their needs and context and to have an open mind about what we could gain from, um, you know, the knowledge that others have as well. And one way that I'm looking at kind of being more cognizant of this is by trying to reframe the whole idea of international aid. That's one of my portfolios. And, and I want to really push forward with this idea that international aid is not some charity um, that developed nations or you know global north give to the global south, but these are actually reparations owed to those nations because of the injustices that were done to them. So I think for me, this collaboration is about really learning from our neighbours. In addition to uh, decolonization or the colonial legacy. Uh, that still carries on today, uh, as well as the extremes of capitalism uh, and the way that we see it now. Uh, one of the other uh, points of focus you've had in your work has been around uh, feminism and pushing back against patriarchy. Um, everybody has different experiences of patriarchy and situations are different in different parts of the world, though I would argue it's a it's a still a challenge everywhere. Mm. There are obviously some similarities uh, between different people's experiences, even though the particular symptoms might be different. Could you uh, tell us a little bit about how women, and especially women in politics, face patriarchy in Australia and any other 
um, uh, thoughts you might have for the same around the Asia Pacific region? Well, I think this year kind of dawned in Australian politics with allegations of you know, sexual abuse and, and sexism in the highest office in our country. And although it wasn't surprising, it was really shocking um, you know, for it to be brought forth yet again in such a horrible, um, you know, such horrible, terrible experiences of young women. And, and I have to say this year, it's been really hard um, to walk into that parliament every day and um, my skin has really crawled and I can't even imagine, you know, those survivors, um, victim survivors of sexual abuse, how they would be feeling. Um, and if that's what's happening in this highest office in parliament that is meant to keep us safe, we can only imagine, um, you know, what goes on in society. So for me, I mean, obviously patriarchy is, is universal. Patriarchy also knows no borders. Um, and growing up in Pakistan, I was very, very conscious of um, the gender inequality. And I was very lucky to grow up um, with, in the shadow of um, an aunt of mine who was a very staunch feminist. And, you know, she, from a very early age, kind of taught me how to stand up and, and fight for um, gender equality. Um, but also, as I said earlier, growing up there, um, you do... Um, you do kind of have this perception that countries like Australia have actually reached equality um, in every sense of the word, in society, in workplaces, and um, economic equality and gender equality. So I must say I was quite shocked when I got here. I, I did my civil engineering in Pakistan and then started a master's when I got here, Nick. Um, and in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UNSW at that time, this is early 90s, there was only one uh, female academic in the school, in the whole school. Um, and I don't think things have changed too much since then. So kind of that was the first point where my rose colored glasses coming off a bit uh, about what my ideas about equality and how it had been reached in Australia were. And obviously we know now how far away from gender equality we are. Um, you know, one woman dies every week from domestic violence. We know there's a huge gender uh, pay gap. We saw the treatment of the first woman prime minister of Australia, Julia Gillard, how she was hounded um, by the media and had a very short stint at that. Um, so there is so much um, to be done across the world in terms of um, dismantling, smashing patriarchy. But I also know that while patriarchy is universal, so is feminism. Um, and, you know, we have, we, you, you have to look back at the history and the different waves of feminism to see how far we've come, but we still have it. And this year was a real reminder for us of, of how far we have to go. And that's why for me, I have a totally unapologetic stand on gender equality. I, I just think I, I, ca I cannot believe that statistics and reports tell us that it might take another four generations for us to reach gender equality. And when often these reports talk about gender equality, they talk about, you know, the binary of men and women. They don't even consider, you know, the group of people that might make up women. And, you know, these are migrant women, these are refugee women, these are First Nations women, these are women of color, trans women, disabled women. Um, so there is so much work to be done, but it has to be done collectively. And this work must be intersectional and inclusive. You, you mentioned uh, Julia Gillard, Australia's first female prime minister uh, and other examples as well. But you also have faced a lot of criticism during your time uh, in parliament. Uh, some of that has been about the issues and the ideas, but a lot has also been based on your ethnicity and gender. Uh, I remember a series of Facebook videos you did, uh, Love Letters to Maureen, uh, where you read out some of the horrible abuse that, that you and your office had received. Um, the videos were a lighthearted way to highlight the, the terrible ways people treat each other and women and minorities specifically. Um, in our gender equity trainings in APGF, we include a session on dealing with negatives. 
how do you deal with negatives? How do you deal with it and keep finding the energy to stand up and make your voice heard? Um, I think that's such a, a good question because, you know, often I'm asked about, you know, these experiences of prejudice and, you know, do I expose it? Do I call it out? You know, how do I fight back? And it's really that people talk about the negatives and how it has a real grinding effect. I mean, because it is toxic and it does take an effort to push back. Um, against and it it does take its toll on our lives and the lives of our families and those around them and it, it really can be crushing day in and day out um, and sometimes the advice that I get from well-wishers is to you know Marine just develop a thick skin but from my perspective I think that really misses the point I actually don't want to develop a thick skin because once you develop a thick skin then I don't think you can feel for anyone um, you know, I don't want to become immune to the needs and feelings of the people that I interact with daily, that I represent, and I'd rather suffer pain and be disappointed when the go going gets tough rather than lose my sensitivity and vulnerability. But with that obviously comes um, and this, um, you know, comes the toll. And there have been days when I just, it, like, I, I don't want to get out of my doona. Um, I always knew, Nick, that my time in politics wouldn't be easy because it's never easy to rock the boat. Um, but also, what's the point of me being in this, you know, quite privileged position if I don't disrupt um, and if I don't agitate? Um, and that purpose alone, I think, does keep that fire and rage alive. Um, but of course, it is always, you're never alone when you do these things. And it is the support and love of my family, my team, um, so many um, in the greens. Um, and, you know, outside on the streets as well, that is the only way that not only keeps me grounded, but gives me hope and positivity as well. You mentioned the, the role that privilege can play uh, and that you are using some of your privilege to advance feminism. Um, another group with privilege in our society with patriarchy is obviously men. Uh, and there are many men who, um, who want to be part of the solution, who want to be good feminists or feminist allies. What advice would you give to them? How can and should men be part of the feminist solution? Mm -hmm. And I do, I kind of um, reflect on this question in my book as well, this role that uh, men should play in the feminist struggle and, you know, can, be, can they actually be trusted to help break down the very system that advantages them and can they truly be feminists? Um, I think men are free to be feminists. Um, I've got, you know, two men very close to me, my husband and my son, who are amazing feminists and have always supported me, stood beside me, stood behind me, never in front of me. But I think the, the kind of feminism that I expect from men is not the performative or the tokenistic feminism, you know, that sometimes can be characterized by wearing a white ribbon or the right um, t-shirt with the right slogan or putting a, you know, popular frame on your profile picture. Um, it's because feminism is not about them. It's about us. And if men truly want to be true allies, then they must be, um, you know, willing to forego power, dominance, control, coercion. They must be willing to listen and learn. And I've said this often to shut up as well. Um, and, you know, and that means that they should be fine with staying behind the scenes and leaving the space wide open for women to take center stage. Um, you know, it means um, not hijacking conversations on women's issues. Um, it means calling yourself a feminist, not only in spaces where it might draw praise, but in the male dominated spaces, which, um, you know, are more challenging, like, you know, like the, like the cabinet or, you know, locker rooms. So I think that's the kind of feminism that can truly be um, allied um, from men. You've got to walk the, you know, you've got to walk the walk, not just say that you're a feminist and then not provide 
space for women to, to do their feminism the way they want to on their terms. Mm. One of the things you mentioned in your book uh, when you were discussing um, the push to decriminalise abortion in the Australian state of New South Wales was progressives' fear of failure. Can you say a bit more about this? I must say I was baffled when um, I found out after coming to Australia, and this was some years before I joined um, the New South Wales Parliament, that in, in New South Wales, abortion at that time was a criminal offence, both for um, the person having the abortion and the doctor who was, um, um, you know, providing the procedure. And that no one in the more than 100 year history of New South Wales Parliament had attempted to decriminalise abortion. And when I actually started having that discussion in Parliament, it was the progressives from the labour movement who were the unhappiest and who tried their best to stop me. Uh, from going ahead with this because their arguments to me were were like like stay quiet women generally can access abortion um something could go really wrong because we've got such a conservative parliament um and if your bill doesn't pass then it will push um this change even further down the line but the more i looked at it the more i realized like come on we've waited more than 100 years for this change surely we have to start speaking about it. If we don't, then nothing will change. And the more I spoke to the community and people outside of parliament about it, the more I found out that they were really hankering for this to happen, that a vast, vast majority of people did not want us to be, you know, and um, have this archaic law. Um, so I think that's when I decided it, it was, it seemed like it was a fear of failure uh, was a big aspect of why people hadn't gone ahead with that. Of course, there were conservatives in the Labour Party as well who would not let them push for this change. But I think that, yes, the bottom line is when you are taking on big issues, there will always be risks, you know, but there are also risks of not doing that. And the risks of not doing that was the, the brunt that the women were actually facing. So yes, because abortion was still a criminal activity. There was huge shame and stigma attached to it. Um, and there were clinics on the Eastern seaboard, but once you go into remote regional areas, it was really hard to access. It's expensive, it's privatized. So those were the risks. And I thought the fear of those risks was much bigger um, than the fear of something not changing. And at the end of the day, um, our campaign was proven right because once we put that debate on the political and public agenda, um, there was no way of putting it back in, in, in the box. It was out there, there was so much momentum. And even though my bill didn't pass, so you know you could say that my bill failed, but I, I didn't care. It wasn't ego that was leading me to do it. What I knew was that once we had momentum built on this issue, it was going to be inevitable. And so while my bill didn't pass, the Greens bill didn't pass, two years after that, a cross-party bill passed and abortion is decriminalized now in New South Wales. So you've got to take some of these risks. Of course, you've got, got to think of all the consequences as well, um, but there will always be trepidation when you're trying to make big changes and you've just got to do it, have the courage and the conviction to move forward with it. It sounds like if if you repeat to yourself that now is not the right time, then you won't get the change that you want to see. And if enough people are saying now is not the right time, nobody is creating the right time to have the discussion and to make the change. Absolutely. And you've got to make that time right. Hmm. So I'm aware that uh, you're being very generous with your time. Uh, we have just two more questions. Uh, first is reflecting on your journey. Uh, what's one piece of advice or wisdom that you'd like to share with especially young women wanting to enter politics, um, but young people generally, uh, people who want to change the status quo and push for a better future? 
Um, this is linked to a little bit to the last question that you asked and the advice will be the same advice that I give myself and have been giving myself for many years now. It's to feel the fear and do it anyway. And believe me, it's worth it. That's right. I love that phrase. Uh, so last question, uh, and it's a big one. Why do you do this work? Okay. It, it is a really big one. Um, and I know that you've been reading my book a bit. So once when you get to the epilogue, someone mentioned it to me the other day that this was the longest epilogue that they had read ever in a book. And I do explore this question in there. Is it all worth it? You know, uh, why do I keep doing what I keep doing? And, and I think, as you said, it's a big question and it did demand some reflection and contemplation. Um, there's no doubt that, you know, it is an enormous honor and privilege to be um, this first person of a group to be represented in a powerful institution. But I think being that first also comes with immense responsibility, you know, of trying to kind of make it easier for others, um, of trying to change it for the better. And, and I do take that very seriously. Um, because at the end of the day, I want to shake up the system, of course, but I also want others who might want to take the same journey as me, make it easier for them to make that journey. Um, and that can only happen um, if I use this opportunity that I have by telling it exactly like it is, and then by agitating, by speaking up, and by disrupting for the changes that we all want to see. Well, as I said at the start of this interview, you have been and continue to be an inspiration to many in our movement. So thank you very much for your time uh, today and sharing your wisdom with us. Oh, thank you so much, Nick. And I can never say this enough times, but I can only do this because I know that there are incredible people who give me love and support um, like you and many others in our movement. And it's that solidarity which keeps us all going. We're very lucky to have you. Uh, that has been all the time we have left. Uh, thank you to Dr. Maureen Faruqi, uh, Australian Green Senator in uh, the Australian Senate and recent author uh, of the book, Too Migrant, Too, oh, Too Migrant, Too Muslim, Too Loud, which at least in Australia you can find in any bookshop that's worth going to, uh, and also in audiobook format, um, if you've enjoyed this conversation today. Thank you very much. And thank you again to Maureen, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you.